Well, my guest, my guest today is Erica Freysarker. Is that correct? Uh, Freysarker, right. close, yeah. Yeah, uh, and today we're going to talk about the Weimar Republic. And um, I always ask my guests in the beginning, where, where did the interest as to study the Weimar Republic come from? Well, interestingly, I always had an interest in studying German history, and I came to the Weimar Republic in particular through graduate work and being involved in a museum studies program where, uh, because I could read German, I was asked to work on a collection of hyperinflationary money, and it just opened the door to all of this stuff that I had never known before. And it was really, really interesting to kind of dig into just all the pits and and valleys and mountains and all of the things that were happening during the Weimar Republic, yeah. obviously in the lead up to Nazism, but yeah. in the wake of World War One. And so it was just, I'd always been aware of it, but it was never something I focused on. And it just was so fascinating to me that- It's not the became, part you learn about in school, is it? No, typically not. And especially not the uh, the reasons why I was learning about it. So I had to, you know, do crash course basically on, yeah. on you know, why this money was important, why there was so much of it and, and what it represented. So it was really an interesting and almost organic way to come to it through other interests in a, in a lot of ways. Yeah. So what, what is, what, and we, oh, spoiler alert, but uh, what is it about the Weimar Republic that made us made us fail? We don't need to talk in depth about this as well, but why did why did it fail as it did as a republic? Uh, well, and it's and it's interesting because I've been you know I'm engaged in in networks with other scholars and do a lot of reading. Obviously, I just got done teaching a uh, history of Germany that was from unification all the way to today as much as possible, and and I think the interesting counter question to your question is, did it really fail? Did it not do what it was kind of designed to do, which was to give a lot of voice to a lot of voiceless people before that? And so, you know, obviously as a functioning republic where things worked and it was stable and it would carry on for a very long time in, in that way, it failed. Uh, partially, I think, under the weight of itself in, in a lot of ways. You know, it had a lot of different histories. Uh, it had a very short history of being a unified country. It definitely had no history of democracy, at least not in a widespread way. And, and so in the wake of this catastrophic war, where it not only had to grapple with what that meant and, and come to terms with the end of a war that it didn't expect to lose, didn't expect to become a democracy, didn't expect to have 20 to 30 political parties nationally, to say nothing of all the regional parties that would be competing for a voice. I think part of the problem that Weimar had was it went from squashing a lot of voices and a lot of political power to opening up the floodgates and not having a clue how to do that. And it also suffered a little bit, I think, of buy-in from the people that it was trying to give voice to, uh, partially because, again, there was no history there, but it also, one of the first things that the Weimar Republic did as an entity was sign the Treaty of Versailles. And that just poisoned the well from the beginning in a lot of ways. And, and so I they, think, were, they were unpopular from the start? It's just... In many ways, yeah. And I think part of it is because, you know, not just, how the Versailles Treaty was enforced and, and pushed on the German public, or at least how it was viewed, right? In, in the way that popular opinion viewed the Treaty of Versailles, but also just the fact that this was not a negotiation that the losing side was invited to. Uh, the delegation from Germany was basically brought in at the end of the Paris Peace Conference and said, here, sign this, and by the way, the British blockade will not lift until you do. And so the Weimar Republic really inherited a, a huge mess. I mean, to put it in 2021 terms, right? A huge dumpster fire. Anything that could go wrong was going wrong. Deprivation on the home front, lack of trade and inability to really take care of the people. And though the war never came home, there was no real 
fighting in Germany per se, and there wasn't occupation, say, of German cities at the end. Right. Uh, there was widespread social revolution. There was uprisings. There were uprisings. There were, you know, it, political extremists, communists who were making it seem like the Russian revolution was going to come to the German states or any of the cities in Germany itself. And this brand new government that was kind of flailing around in the wake of the abdication of the Kaiser. And so even though all of those things are distinct and we can trace the history of each and every one when you put them all together, it didn't really set the Weimar Republic in a good direction to start with. So and that I, persisted. I, yeah. I want to ask how how did it form the republic? If you say that it was before the Versailles, so how did it form? Was the Kaiser still in charge? Did he have anything saying? Who? How was no. there? A, was there a vote to get him in? Was there like elections like we like we have today? There were. Um, to start with, I mean, part of the problem is the way that not only the war ended, at least in terms of public opinion, and and I'm. Fairly certain. I mean, I, I've heard previous episodes of your show where you've talked about World War One and, and just sort of what that all meant in coming out of World War One. The Kaiser abdicated his throne in the midst of uh, mutinies, essentially, by the Kriegsmarine, by you know, naval naval men who did not want to go out on a suicide mission and try to ram through the British blockade in the North Sea for you know, what might not be crazy reasons. They didn't yeah. want to face that kind of, that kind of action. Um, but the Kaiser fled to the Netherlands on November 9th. He left and it effectively left the Reichstag as it was in charge. But, you know, it, it was an, a, it was an authoritarian monarchy. There was a degree, more of a degree of autonomy for elites, especially landowning elites and historical elites coming from the Prussian background and things like that. And there were leaders of different parties like the Social Democrats and like uh, the Catholic Center Party and like others, but never in a way where they had to cobble together some sort of functioning executive, uh, even functioning legislative to close out a war, to start figuring out how be longer than maybe the short term, what that meant for governance. How do you quell uprisings and social uh, upheaval in the wake of a war that was ending badly? And then a war that was essentially declared over, though it, you know, if any historians look at this and, and the, long, the long history of 1918 as the Western Front speeds up and all the other fronts are closing down, it, it makes sense that Germany was outnumbered, it was surrounded. It, this was not a sustainable situation. And the high command said as much, month, two months, three months before the war actually ended. But to the people who were watching and even to the soldiers in the trenches, they never retreated. So for the war to suddenly be declared over in November, November 11th at 11-11, when many German soldiers were still in the trenches in France or in Belgium, and they had never really lost ground. They had never gained ground, but they had never lost ground either. It was really hard to sell that the war was over, that this functionally would make sense, that there was all this economic deprivation and that people on the home front were starving and were sick and the beginnings of the flu and, you know, and, and, and. There are so many things that happened. And so the Kaiser was a non-entity after November 9th. I mean, he really, he was declared in the midst of the Paris Peace Conference a war criminal. So had he come back and tried to reestablish some sort of political power or viability, he could in theory be arrested by the League of Nations or by some other, uh, some other entity and effectively labeled a war criminal. So it was sort of a, not a rudderless, no leader situation, but there were a lot of leaders. They had differing opinions, different approaches that they had to exercise while closing out an international war, a great war, and figuring out what that meant for what next. And, and so on one hand, it's about let's hammer out a constitution. We really want to make this legal, spell it out, have everybody know what their rights are. Uh, who can vote, who can't vote, how this works. And then 
find our way forward. So it was a lot of trial and error while you're in the situation. And it wasn't a structure, set it up and then let it run. It was, we have to sort of build the house around ourselves as we're going forward. So you have Friedrich Ebert, you have some other uh, leaders who were known politicians, who were known political leaders, but had not been the political leader, had not been the people in charge. Uh, that, that had always been the Kaiser. Even if we talk about actual functional power, the appearance of that political power being gone was enough to kind of destabilize and shake people to their core to kind of be uncertain what this future meant and what democracy meant and what German democracy would mean. And I want to ask because the communism was still pretty new at this point, right? With mm -hmm. Russia just be, becoming the Soviet Union. And how mm -hmm. did people in Germany view communism? Were most people for or against communism? And how, did, they fear, did they fear it at this point? Like we did after World War II? Did it? Mm -hmm. Or, or did, they, did they more like up and break, try to embrace communism? Because uh, reading Tolan's book, it seemed like mm -hmm. a lot of people were pro communism at that time. Uh, I think there were many. I mean, the as far as communism goes as an entity, as a political approach, or even as just a way of looking at the world, right? A, mm -hmm. a worldview. Uh, on one hand, you have a lot of different variants of communism. You know, you have Marxist Leninism, you have Marxism, you have other... Yeah, right, exactly. And so you have the civil war, what's becoming the civil war after the Russian revolution still ongoing. I mean, keep in mind the war ended November 11th of 1918. You really have the Russian revolution getting going in 1917 and effectively a civil war happening until 1922 when Lenin is finally declared in charge. But that that was a process. I mean, we're still only a year or two into that. And so the jury is still out as far as what communism in the emerging Soviet Union is going to be. There were different communist or even socialist parties and entities battling it out with the support and sometimes against uh, some of the Western allies. You know, there were Western allies after World War I that were fighting in the, the Russian civil war, essentially, even into 1921, all the way in the East, like beyond on the Pacific. So that was something that was still emerging, but it was scary to a lot of people who really valued this sense of stability. This is how things are done. This is what we're going to do. For other people, you know, there was a thriving communist party and a thriving communist heritage in Germany. Uh, there were definitely people who were on the more radical side, you know, Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Liebknecht, some other uh, communist leaders. There were socialists that kind of viewed themselves as not being in the same vein. Let's and not forget again, that Goebbels was also a communist in the beginning. Mm, and, and in a lot of ways, it's sort of a being against a specific system that's in power, wanting to establish some sort of system meant for workers, what that looks like, again, just like mm -hmm. with the Weimar democracy getting sort of built around itself, that's what's happening in all of these, in all of these other movements as well. And so it really depended on one's political persuasion, one's viewpoint, where one lives, what one had lived through, you know, it, it, it's, it's a hard question to say, did people support it or did they not? It, it depended really on, on who you're asking about. You have the people who had been shut out of any sort of political participation for so long based on either land ownership or access to education or access to resources or ancestral wealth. But then you also have workers in an industrializing state. And this is the story across Europe, right? This isn't just a uniquely German story. You have similar struggles and challenges and fears and hopes all across, not just Western Europe, I should even clarify, into the United States at the time, into Australia, into Germany, in, or Japan and China, you have all of these different things and taking into account different contexts, right? I think it, it really does depend. You have a lot of battling about 
what it meant to be communist, what it meant to be socialist, what is the difference? What does that mean for political power? What does that mean for ruling in your hometown? And does that mean overthrowing something and installing what some critics and some people would argue is effectively a, another type of dictatorship that limits you know, access to resources and really divvies things out in a very centrally planned way. Uh, I know that probably doesn't totally answer your question, but there were examples of movements to establish what effectively were Soviets, not like yeah. the Soviet Union, but Soviets and Soviet communes like one in Munich that lasted in 1919 uh, for about two months right after the deaths of Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg in January of 1919. So even leaders who had been recognizable in not only global communism or the second international or something like that, but also locally in local communist movements, socialist movements, you know, there, there was uh, upheaval there too. And, and so by and large, I would say, you know, the mo mostly the middle class and even the upper class feared this idea of communism sweeping across German cities and taking it over and, and really supplanting any other type of government and becoming a Russia. But it's also because they were watching a Russia in a civil war and they did not want that at home. So was the Weimar Republic upper class politicians or were they all kind of people? I, I would argue, I mean, obviously the people who were known in political circles started out being elites, but there was this real effort. I think, I think there were a lot of intentions to bring in all kinds of voices. And you do see, you know, different parties like the SPD, which are the Social Democrats, and then the splinter group, the USPD, which were the independent Social Democrats, and then moving farther left, as well as moving farther right, and different fragmentation, atomization almost of the political system. And it's an effort to give more people participation. They make in the 1919 Weimar Constitution. So the first constitution that is written that is effectively voted on and, and adopted right around the same time as signing the Treaty of Versailles gives universal suffrage to women as well as men. And that was something that had not been available before. So you have new voters who had never been part of the system who were figuring out not only where they were and who they were and what they were, but then figuring out what are the circumstances, what's going on, right? Is this about survival and economic survival? Who is going to best ensure not only my survival and my recovery, but then, you know, going forward, my financial health, my family's health, my cultural health, my social health, and all of those things. I mean, a lot of this, where people kind of gravitated, I would argue, and I'm I'm kind of an economic historian in that I see the economy as helping not make people's decisions for them, but are certainly part of decision making, including, you know, who am I going to vote for? How am I going to vote for them? Do I vote for individuals or do I vote for a party? And that was sort of the, the system that was put in place, at least from the outset. And I, I, you sort of answered this question already, but I want to ask because Germany was this democracy was totally new for Germany at this time with the whole the Roman Empire before and then Prussia, right mm -hmm. after with the Kaiser. So what, how did the people react to a democracy being and a republic being put in Germany? Uh, I, again, <laughs> my students all tell me that this is a brief soccerism that everything, it depends. I answer, it depends to absolutely everything. And to an extent, they're right. And that's because it really does. There were people who were actively hostile to democracy being s built in Germany and for a variety of reasons, whether it was, we don't want a democratic system at all. We want the monarchy back. Uh, or they wanted an oligarchy type of situation, or they just wanted to bring the whole thing down and make a dictatorship based on whatever, right? It, there were a lot of different groups that were hostile to democracy from the beginning openly, including a lot of far right-wing groups and some far left-wing groups, right? That 
for a variety of reasons that they did not trust democracy in general. Uh, and that there was sort of this view that there was no history to that. I mean, I think in some ways, uh, there were some places where you start to move toward more democracy. You don't have widespread or universal participation, certainly. But there were some independent cities. I do a lot of my research on the city of Lubeck, which was a Hanseatic city. It was an independent city for a long time, largely led and ruled by merchants groups. And I would not call it a democracy, but there is sort of a sense of shared governance in a way from the, especially the economic or commerce leaders of the city. And so there are elements that looked a little familiar to some people who had been able to to access the system ahead of, of the Weimar Republic. But some people were just sort of enthusiastic and excited about the possibilities. I mean, none of these people lived in isolation. Obviously, if you're working class and you're working you know, 12, 13, 14 hours a day, you have a different viewpoint and a different set of things you do in leisure, but it's not that people were unaware of other democratic systems like the United States or unaware of other economic systems or other political ventures, other people who were agitating to have access to I mean, the mean, were assisted even back then. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, it was a huge diversity of opinion. And in some ways it was about how do you get a sense of what that opinion was and who gets to say it. And I haven't even touched on groups that were historically kind of held at arm's length or kept out of governance, say, during the Holy Roman Empire or, or even uh, during the Kaiserreich, uh, like Jews, for example, who do steadily find ways to enter into the system and be able to get access to civil service or some of the other structures that help keep you know an uh, a place going and and that had broadened a little bit in the late 1800s but you still have you know really embedded anti-semitism all you have to do is look at france and the dreyfus affair and the ripple effects of all of that to really get a sense of how embedded that is but by the time we get to 1919, and this is one of the benefits of the Weimar Republic, and its sort of view that democracy opens the door to a lot of things, is that you have what Peter Gay, who is known as a you know really interesting cultural historian, wrote in 1968, The Outsider is Insider. And it's one of my favorite books on the Weimar Republic. It's really interesting in talking about people who had been viewed as outside the system were now finding pathways in, in different ways, whether it was through cultural innovation, whether it was because, unfortunately, of the hyperinflation that really takes hold by 1923 that just puts everybody kind of in a uncertain spiral that, unfortunately, for later, if we're looking at the tea leaves and reading the future, are going to find, you know, industrialists being able to amass a lot of wealth because they have access to mechanisms everyday people don't. But you do find a lot of people getting a sense that, you know, there are no set systems, not even currency, not even inheritance, right? And not even work. And, and that means that it does open the door a little bit and give people some, I don't know, some, some possibility of change. Not to say everybody loves that, but there is sort of a sense that you have a really diverse field of public opinion toward. We know about somebody who did definitely not like that. Right, right. <laughs> well, many somebodies, many somebodies for sure, yeah. So how did it go on about rebuilding Germany? They just found it inside the Treaty of Versailles, and what's mm -hmm. the next step for the Weimar Republic? <sighs> That's a good question too. And I think part of it is, the next step really is about doing several things all at once, right? On one hand, it's about returning to normalcy in a way where you have trading relationships rebuild, where there is a sense of getting back to normal where you know people can go and buy food. Uh, one of the things that happens at 
around the end of the war and partially because of how the war was funded is that there's this system of currency called note guild, right? It, it directly translates to emergency money. And there's a lot of different sort of subdivisions of that system, but it was basically an unregulated currency market. And it was meant as a way as a stopgap measure to just kind of keep the home front economy going while all this money is getting poured into the war efforts, whether it was, you know, the, the colonial fighting force in East Africa or whether it was, you know, the, the Kriegsmarine and trying to fight against the British on the high seas or whether it was on either front, the Western, the Eastern, or whether it was fighting in the former Ottoman Empire, right? It was about so much attention and the priority being funding the war effort that these sort of stopgap measures in order to pay people so they could go and buy bread, so they could go buy flour, so that they could, you know, go to work and go to the factories and, and get paid and all of the things that people do while war is going on, right? Life doesn't stop just because yeah. the war is going. Um, but that's so persisted. Yeah, something Look, I actually ahead. want to ask you as well. What was the financial situation for the Weimar Republic like? And you mentioned that the people needed to get paid, they needed the life goes mm -hmm. on, but what was was the financial situation like? Uh, Pretty terrible. <laughs> Pretty terrible. I, I When I teach about the Weimar Republic in the 1920s, uh, you, you sort of have to divide Germany's experience in the 1920s into two phases. And I would argue the first phase is really this terrible phase of not not only trying to rebuild, and it's not rebuilding physically, right? The war doesn't really happen in Germany, uh, but it's rebuilding economic structures, again, imports, exports, all of those things that go along with diplomacy that had been interrupted because of the war. But um, <laughs> this is the time where you have hyperinflation and this spirals out of control over a series of years, right? By 1920, 1921, the financial situation is, is kind of dodgy because on one hand, you have the imposition of reparations from outside. Right, you have this reparations that has to be paid in gold. It can't be paid in commodities. It can't be paid in paper. It was, you have to access gold reserves to pay France and Britain for the war, for the um, damage to the war. And I imagine this wasn't easy with that German having lost their colonies as well, where most of the gold, right. I assume, came from. Right, and, and also too, it's not just losing the colonies, it's also losing other parts of what many Germans viewed as being the homeland itself. Alsace-Lorraine, which had gone back and forth between France and Germany back over decades, centuries, uh, that had been taken again in the Franco-Prussian War and really annexed and brought into the German state is now returned or brought back into the French state, which had a lot of industrial capabilities. You know, Strasbourg is there. It's a very cultural center. Uh, you also have other parts of the borderlands that kind of get stripped away and, and taken and then demilitarized also. The industrial heartland of Germany and the Rhineland is actually occupied in parts as a way to ensure that work is ongoing so that exports can happen so that you can find coal and make steel and do all that stuff so you can get the gold so you can pay France and Germany or France and Britain. Um, and so you have that area that is completely demilitarized and, and overseen in some ways by the victorious Entente that it made it really difficult, I think, and very, Germans very resentful of all of this. Um, and so getting access to gold reserves, I mean, there's finite gold reserves in a lot of ways. This is the period of time where you see a lot of countries leaving the gold standard. And so getting access to that type of commodity that does sort of retain some inherent value. It fluctuates, but it does retain more value than say paper money would, as we'll see when we talk about hyperinflation. Um, that was one problem. The other problem was in order to finance the war and not raise taxes on the aristocracy and not raise taxes on 
the, the middle class. Uh, the government had basically taken out a series of war loans that promised upon victory a you know four percent return or a, a percent return on investment. Basically, would have been funded by reparations on the entente to pay then their investors for the war. Well, that didn't happen. Obviously, they lost, and and so you have a lot of people who had given money that maybe they couldn't reclaim and they couldn't really part with that kind of money. So you have a lot of people whose savings were impacted and people who wouldn't typically have been impacted as much. So on one hand, you have all these external factors. Gerald Feldman wrote a book called The, the Great Inflation, really great book or the, oh, now, I'm, now that his title escapes me, but he is the one who writes about this in really great detail and talks a little bit about not only the economic side of things, but also then the social and cultural impacts as well. Great and disorder. And not to great mention, disorder. Yeah. Yeah. And doesn't mention that we got a great depression coming as well. Right, exactly. So there's all of that going on and just sort of an effort to, to keep things going and to make the decision over, do we want our economy to hum along or do we wanna to have to deal with unemployment? And ultimately the decision was, you know, we'll, we'll trade a little bit of inflation for unemployment because you're talking about a period of time where you do have uprisings, where you do have watching what's happening in Russia. You don't want unemployed people who can't get access and don't have food to be in the streets. You don't want that. That was potentially more existentially threatening to the Weimar Republic in the early days than inflation was. The downside is it just kept spiraling. And so 1921, you really see it start to pick up pace, 1922, uh, because no geld as a system, this unregulated money continued to be printed. And when money ran out, they printed more. And this was not just being printed by something like the Reichsbank. It was also being printed by individual states, individual cities, even individual firms, the the train system in Berlin, the zoo in Berlin, right? Printed its own money in an effort to kind of keep things moving. So it was a little bit of artifice there, right? To keep things moving, keep things going. But it also was kind of an effort to get real capital into the system to try and keep a lid on this inflation that just didn't work. And so by the time you get to November of 1923, which incidentally is when we have the beer hall putch, mm. November 9th. Which we will we come, which we come oh, yeah. back to. Oh yeah, no, November 9th, 1923, which was the anniversary of the Kaiser fleeing in 1918. Um, you also have you know, just the, the system, the economic system bottoming out where one US dollar was equivalent to 4.2 trillion marks with a T. And that's just unsustainable. A loaf of bread in some places was 1.6 billion marks. Like we're talking astronomical where people who were everyday laborers going to work would go to work in the morning, bring their wife with them, they would get their pay. The wife would immediately go and buy the food with the pay for lunch before it lost all its value. Then they would come and get their midday pay and go and buy dinner. And then they would get their evening pay and go and buy breakfast. And because that kept happening and it would just keep getting flooded, the value kept dropping and dropping and dropping. And you started to even see- You could do like Scrooge McDuck and Divey. Divey exactly. <laughs> Exactly. You could go. I mean, there are pictures that are really famous of people with wheelbarrows full of money, people papering, you know, wallpaper with money, people burning money because it that's about as valuable as it was for fuel. And you start to actually see even overlay stamping, just adding zeros on the end of these bills because they actually couldn't even get the paper to print it on. You start to see things being used as currency like clay, uh, clay coins and pieces of wood and pieces of silk that get printed to be currency. And so this whole system just completely bottoms out and 
it, it was unsustainable. I mean, we're on the threat of complete collapse. And over the course of those early years, when inflation is ticking along and starting to spiral, you also have political and social instability, a series of putches, not just the beer hall putch in Munich, but also the cap putch. You have, you know, a lot of people who were basically discharged from the military because of the Treaty of Versailles limits, who now kind of were like, well, I guess I'm not going to be a career soldier, so what am I going to do now? You have paramilitary groups forming called the Freikorps. You have a whole series of things where not least of which is the money you have can't buy anything. The money you have is worthless. It's worth more just to throw in the street than it is to actually use. And so... so yeah, oh, no, 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 uh, was there a lot of emigration because of this from Germany to... I, I, I mean, you see some, but not not really. And partially that's because other countries, especially like the United States, which had historically been a destination for German people. I mean, that's where my ancestors went in the over the course of the 1800s and even earlier, is they were limiting immigration, right? Isolation in the United States was at a high after World War I. They didn't want to have a bunch of immigrants coming in. You have retooling of uh, citizenship laws in the United States and in other countries too. I mean, the, the problems that were happening in Germany as a result of the war and some of these economic issues were not unheard of in Britain, were not unheard of in France. You actually have a general strike in Britain in 1926 that was very problematic for you know, workers in the in industry. And you have a series of, and, and the exact years are escaping me, but you do have uh, sort of, I don't know, um, destabilization in, in France in the interwar period as well, in terms of labor and also in terms of just, you know, how was this war able to be fought completely on our land, right? This idea of we need a stronger France, you know, these fears of depopulation, you see a lot of the same rhetoric all across Europe. So what we finally have is by November, uh, the Reichsbank, especially led by Helmar Schacht and other people finally say, we got to stop this. This is going to go nowhere good and we will just completely be on collapse. So what they do is they bring in a temporary currency called the Rentenmark that is only supposed to exist for six to eight months. There is only a set amount printed, no more will be, and that is the transition currency into the, the Reichsmark. And the Reichsmark, rather than being based on something like gold, because that was earmarked to pay reparations and other things, was based on the US dollar, which was very strong at the time. And you have a series of plans coming out of the United States in terms of diplomacy, like the Dawes plan and the Young plan, Dawes plan in particular, that helped fund the entirety of the German economy. So there was a moment in 1924 when things were pretty stringent, people had more faith in the currency, and this is probably the biggest thing is that not only do you have very real uh, lack of purchasing power, but you have no faith in the economic or political system. So what Schacht was able to do in establishing the very controlled Renton mark in transition to the Reichsmark is bring that faith back. There's a policy in place. It's going, it, it, the, it might be painful, but it will give us the stability that we need. And after 1924, you really do see what, what often is called the golden 20s in Germany. It's the period between 1924 and 1929 where things do stabilize, things are actually good. Germany uh, is able to kind of tap into, in some ways, this whole post-war recovery a little bit. And you see a lot of cultural innovation happening in the Weimar period. This is where you have the flowering of like the film industry. And you have a lot of different car companies and, and other industry and leisure and travel and all of these things happening for about five years. But uh, it, it was sort of the, the period of time where even though politically you still have a lot of turnover at the top and you still have a lot of elections and having to call elections and complete rule by coalition through the entirety of it. 
you do have a period that is a little more stable than the beginning. So I want to ask, with the Weimar Republic and Kaiser being abolished, what, what was Prussia's role in, in during the Weimar Republic? I mean, a lot of people come from Prussia, especially these these political leaders, and also you know moving through the the army corps as well. And some of that is just because of how Germany unified in 1871. And over the course of sort of the mid 1800s, organizing around Prussia rather than organizing around Austria, which was partially where Bismarck comes in. Bismarck really first and foremost being a Prussian and in service to Wilhelm I, right? The Hohenzollerns, the Kaiser who had fled was a Hohenzollern, was the ruling family of Prussia that really became the major state in the German nation, right? But you also have, you know, Bavaria that kind of operated in a in an interesting way. And I'm not an expert in Bavarian politics. I really do focus much more on the Northwest, but you do have, you know, sort of this sense of almost a semi-autonomous region. It's not, it doesn't rule itself necessarily, but it has its own ruling family. It has its own history of kings, like King Ludwig and the Wittelsbox, and they're Catholic as opposed to being Calvinist, which the Hohenzollerns are. And so Prussia is still largely the main leader in terms of state politics within Germany. But you have others as well. I mean, you have, um, you know, three independent city states, you have Bremen and Hamburg and Lubeck, you have ha uh, Hanover, you have Hesse, you have the Palatinate, you have all of these other areas of Germany that are coming in uh, that also are active in constructing this, this nation state. But Prussia still is largely kind of, I would say, the, the dominant one, building in so many ways the political culture in Germany as being this sort of Prussian enlightenment culture that that had emerged we don't we don't think move on a little bit soon but i want to ask as well what, what was it like inside the weimar weimar's weimar uh, government as this the printing of money went down was it chaos or was where they tried to start bring what what, what was it like inside the, the government inside, inside the government i mean you have so first and foremost, the Weimar Republic was ruled by coalitions. Mm. So you always had this kind of back and forth, almost like diplomacy, <laughs> like what you would have in international politics, but you almost have it in Germany as well, because no party ever reached a 50% plus one threshold. There were too many parties and a lot of them were really regionally based. And so you have a very strong Catholic center party who always kind of formed a good backbone to Weimar politics. You have the SPD, the social Democrats that were to the left of center. And then you really have, you know, sort of this conservative, not monarchist, um, but conservative party in the DDP where you have a, a major political leader in Gustav Stresemann, who was a major feature. Um, he wasn't the, the chancellor. He was really the foreign minister, but he kind of anchored a lot of Weimar politics mm -hmm. until 1929. And so he and the rest of them, you know, really were about creating sort of these cobbled together governments. And so as you have economic hardship, you know, you have a lot of different voices and a lot of different approaches to how to fix something like that. Um, do you raise taxes? How do, you, do how does this relate to, you know, how do we pay people? What is it about the social safety net that's making this happen? Because coming out of the war, you know, the Weimar Republic was known for having a pretty socially progressive uh, constitution and also a social safety net in trying to take care of soldiers that had been wounded or coming home, trying to give unemployment insurance, trying to give money to widows and orphans and, and the poor, partially because of just the extreme deprivation of the so-called turnip winter 1916 and 1917 and the ongoing uh, deprivation on the home front. And that meant that there were a lot of bills to pay. 
for the government. I mean, there were a lot of obligations that had been enshrined already. And was the, Sp was the Spanish flu a vital thing at this point as well? Absolutely. I mean, you have, especially at the end of the war, you know, the flu is becoming a major issue. And, and most of the ways I know in the United States, it was really characterized by three major waves of the Spanish, so-called Spanish flu, the influenza. Uh, but, you know, globally, this was a major issue too. It killed millions of people around the world. And, and so there was that uncertainty as well and other diseases too. I mean, when you think about the fact that global warfare means coming in contact with even biological ecosystems that people don't normally come in contact with. If you served in Africa, if you have you know, colonial soldiers in the trenches, which you did, if you have Americans coming over, you know, this does spread germs in a lot of ways. And so by 1920, the flu was largely over. At least it was no longer deemed an epidemic. Um, but that didn't mean that there weren't resurgent waves of flu or disease that kind of- Was this a big around. problem in Germany or did, it wasn't was, that as bad? In, in larger cities, especially I think where soldiers were coming home, you really do see soldiers and soldiers movements um, spreading and containing uh, the flu in a lot of ways. And, you know, rural areas that were less connected and less uh, hot, uh, less cosmopolitan. I, I don't, I don't quite know how to phrase it because I don't want to be like, well, they were cut off from everything and, you know, they were backward and what, that's not what I mean. But rural areas really did see less prevalence of flu. And this was the case in other countries too. I'm more familiar with the United States in this, in this uh, capacity, but so it was an issue, but by 1920, it, it was no longer an issue, at least not one that I see in the archives very much. Really what was dominating the archival material was talking about, you know, how do we navigate reparations and all the things happening at home, but also, the international situation. Germany had been precluded from joining the League of Nations and was sort of being held as not a international pariah per se, but it was definitely not being sought after uh, to, to make treaties with other countries. And so it was done in a lot of unique ways, I would argue. On one hand, you have the Treaty of Rapallo in 1922 that was a treaty between the new Soviet Union and, and Germany that meant that they would trade with each other. And they were sort of two countries where the Entente and the West were like, what do we, we're not quite sure about either of you at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and you also have sort of this effort to bring international travel as a way to not only bring in international money, but also as a way to kind of say, see, we're not the ones that started the war anymore. We're actually good people. Hey, let's come up with some ideas. Uh, one of, a lot of my research focuses mm -hmm. actually on festivals and fairs in Northern Germany with an express eye on Scandinavia as a way to say, mm -hmm. we have a shared heritage. We've been trading for centuries. Remember that Hanseatic League thing, the Baltic Sea's right there. Why don't you come and hang out with us? We're not bad people. You were neutral mm -hmm. during World War I. We can hang out now. Um, and so it was a little less formal in terms of navigating all of this, even as you hash out, what should fiscal policy be? that changes back and forth. What is the role of government? How do we want to frame the way that the government works? It became a semi-presidential system where you have a president and a chancellor, the chancellor largely in charge of the Reichstag and sort of the day-to-day -day head of government functions mm -hmm. and the president that was largely head of state but also had a couple major powers that were important, not least of which was calling elections and appointing the chancellor. And that will become really important in say 1932, 1933. But it also was, um, you know, it was sort of this divided government, partially as a way to ensure some checks and balances, uh, also to navigate a massive party system where you have a lot of different parties, sometimes rising and falling, sometimes splintering, sometimes you know, sort of condensing and, and annexing each other. You know, you have a plethora of far right parties and you have a plethora of 
leftist parties and a plethora of centrist parties. And some of them expressly were about being elected in order to bring down the whole system or being elected to reinstall the Kaiser. Um, you have a system where you elect based on proportional representation. So the Reichstag could have a lot of different voices in it, which is why the coalitions were so important. And, and so when you ask if it's chaos in government, it's not necessarily chaos, but it's certainly loud. It's cacophony. There's so many different voices with so many different approaches. I mean, chaos in the sense that they didn't know what to do with the money being just printed and printed and printed and the economic crushing the great, right. and of course with the great crash in 26 and, and with everything going on, the economy going bad, they had to repay the debt and everything. Mm -hmm. In chaos in that sense, not necessarily inside the government as well, but you know, in what to do, what to do with the situation. Right, right. And that's why, you know, the emergence of Helmar Schacht, who, you know, his mother was English and he really had this sense of, it's about, even though it might seem counterproductive in an effort to put the lid on this economic side of things, we need to limit it, control it. And even if it means it feels like there's pain, we got to do it or, you know, unemployment and hyperinflation is just going to result in a revolution. And when you have things like the beer hall push that kind of puts things in perspective, you have sort of a rush of people. The, the desire of the government was not to have people rush to the peripheries of the political system, right? The far right or the far left. They wanted to try and keep as many people in the center as possible in order to move forward. And after 1924, for about five years, you have that a little bit. You have a bit of stability and the Rentenmark was viewed pretty favorably, even if really its main strength was just the appearance of limitation. Uh, ushering in the Reichsmark that was based on a different currency, but a currency that was viewed as pretty strong, this really was the beginning of what we can call almost the American century of the 20th century because the US had been protected by two oceans, came over, participated in World War I, then went back home and went, we're done. We are out. We don't want to join the League of Nations. That's all y'all's problem in Europe. Keep us out of it. And we're going to go back to doing what we're doing, which is whatever we're doing. Um, and so you know, kind of getting that under control actually helped deal with other things. Uh, there were times where the chancellor had to rule by decree, and that was with that that happened periodically before 1933. But um, as much as possible, it was about finding consensus. And that was really, really difficult, which is why elections kept getting called. And there were a lot of elections over the course of the Weimar Republic. The actual number right now escapes me off the top of my head, but there were quite a few elections. And so you, you almost get election fatigue voting for this party's list. And you know, the, pro, the number of people or the proportion of votes determined the proportion of seats in the Reichstag. So you just sort of count down and that's how many people go to the Reichstag. And so it, it was definitely a lot, a lot going on in pursuit, I think of good things, but I don't know how effective it was. And in 1919, Hitler joined a certain group that would change probably across of Germany forever. Um, mm -hmm. How, and how, as a growing power, when does the Weimar Republic start noticing Hitler and the Nazis growing? And what what is their reaction to this? They for they do not get to the Berhold Poach in a minute, of course, but what, just right. what was their reaction to Hitler and the Nazi Party growing? Well, to start with, I mean, on one hand, the Weimar Republic was concerned about extremism. And believe it or not, Hitler was sent to the then called German Workers' Party to watch it for the Weimar Republic. It was there while he was observing it for the government that he joined it and it started to evolve. Um, but it was just like the Nazis, for example, were just one of kind of a tapestry of far right parties. They weren't alone. 
in espousing hypernationalism and anti-Semitism and anti-democratic ideas. They, they were part of a very well-populated group. They were kind of viewed as fringe and, and a little crazy. And so they were dismissed a lot. Um, but there was sort of a growing concern, at least in terms of extremism in the abstract. Uh, at least in the United States papers, uh, some of my earlier research was about far right groups and Nazi groups in the United States in the interwar period. And I'm from Milwaukee and the German language Milwaukee papers and even just the English language Milwaukee papers didn't really call the Nazis the Nazis until you're almost on World War II. I mean, even through the 30s, they called them the Hitlerites and they referred to Hitler as the mad house painter from Vienna. Like they kind of dismissed him as a threat. The bigger mm -hmm. threat that they felt was actually the communists. And so they, they watched them, but they were kind of viewed as not really being able to mobilize numbers that would be existentially threatening. Now, that sort of changed a little bit in the early 1920s. I mean, you have, again, a series of putches, the cap putch, for example, in 1920, that really was from far right and disillusioned people from the military who became Freikorps, these, these um, sort of paramilitary groups that emerged in the wake of the Treaty of Versailles. Um, cap escaped and to, I believe, Sweden and never was charged, he never came you know, to justice or anything like that. And in fact, a lot of the military actually sympathized with the putschists in 1920, which is part of the reason why the Reichstag actually fled Berlin and went to Weimar for a while. Um, Hitler's putsch in, in Munich was again, sort of another one. And by this point it had been rebranded, um, you know, the National Socialist German Workers' Party and National Socialist, one word in German, Right, but that whole sort of socialist dog whistle to try and lure workers over away from say leftists or communists um, to then be active in bringing down the Weimar democracy that had been betrayed. Mostly they argued from this, you know, by the stab in the back. And there were a lot of people who were advocating the stab in the back myth that, you know, the war didn't so have why to did, be lost. Why did Hitler start out with this? Why does he we stabbed in the back? Is this just his brilliance in speech? Is that why he stood out? Uh, you know, it's very, very interesting in, in terms of thinking about why Hitler did what he did. I mean, some of the really interesting biographies, Ian Kershaw's uh, two volume biography of Hitler really digs into all the different reasons for why he's kind of viewed as having charisma. Uh, I, at the beginning, he didn't necessarily have charisma per se. He was honing his craft. He was able to sort of get fired up in speeches and things like this. But he also, you know, he was Austrian. He wasn't German. He had served in the German military. So in a way he was kind of viewed a little bit as an outsider, but it was more about what he was talking about. The things he was talking about, yes, they were virulently anti-Semitic, absolutely. Um, but they also were emphasizing things that worried people like unemployment. Now, obviously to solve the unemployment problem for many Germans was to then make many Jews unemployed. And it was sort of viewed as mutually exclusive, right? We don't, we, we don't wanna employ everybody. Somebody has to win and somebody has to lose and we don't wanna be the ones who lose. And so some of it was about message. It was about sort of, in a lot of ways, if, if you know, this idea of a lost cause, right? And this is a rhetoric that is being talked about a lot in the United States right now and in the wake of the civil war. Um, but this idea of the stab in the back myth that we didn't have to lose the war. We didn't have to lose you know, some of our prestige or our reputation of being a very, well you know, disciplined army and very powerful and able to colonize and, and all of these things, as well as the land of culture and the land of poetry and, and all of these other things. But at its foundation, it really, you know, race and racism and anti-Semitism really was kind of this 
understood foundation to what Hitler was talking about. He was just able to then go in other directions in terms of topic and talk about things like infrastructure. How can you get from one end of Germany to the other easily? What about workers? How can you access things like vehicles and education and things like that? And it really kind of foreshadowed the different ministries that were going to pop up in the ways that then when the party gets going, uh, and I usually use, I know this is in the 1930s, so beyond the Weimar Republic, but you can sort of see this echoed in Lenny Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will, where she's showing some of the different rallies that were happening in Nuremberg in 1934. And they have, you know, we're talking about building the Autobahn, we're talking about the, the German labor front, we're talking about this, and where are you from? You're from that corner of Germany. And, and really distinctly, shifting the focus away from Prussia in some ways and trying to say we're all pulled from all these different areas and that's the thing that he was doing and that he was sort of mesmerizing that you know people I think in some ways wanted to sort of see what he'd say next you know we we sort of get that sense and he was willing to travel he was willing to pursue a lot of exposure and go from one end of Germany to the other particularly when he was uh, campaigning for president in 1932. And so he did stuff that way in ways that other people didn't. So, and of course, now we find that John mentioned the, the imperial putsch. And, did, and when he does enter and say that this is a revolution, stand down, you have been surrounded, this is, a, we are now in the government. Did, did they fear that he would succeed as Mussolini and the black shirts did? Or did, did they have faith that this would just be a little face? It's, it's more, or less, more or less just a thing. It's gonna be get out of the ring. Right, that's an interesting question too. And I think on one hand, I don't think they would have undertaken it if they didn't think they could be successful. On the other hand- I'm talking about the Weimar Republic's of course reaction to the-, the Right, yeah. I mean, Keeping in mind that at the Beer Hall Putsch, you have sort of the, what Hitler later would call and a lot of Nazis would call the old fighters, the people who were, you know, there, the Strassers, and you have some of the others um, who were inner circle very early, but you also have a war hero who was there and part of the Nazis, and that's Erich Ludendorff. Mm -hmm who had been, you know, one of the German high command during World War I, one of the two, you know, largely talked about war heroes. There were more, you know, obviously, but Hindenburg and Ludendorff were sort of viewed as kind of the big names coming out of uh, the war experience in Germany. And Ludendorff had really helped propagate some of this victory from, or defeat from the jaws of victory that they had, really been stabbed in the back, even though behind the scenes, you know, leading up to the end of World War One, he'd been saying, this is unsustainable, we can't get bullets, like we're, we gotta come up with something or we are going to be invaded, our line is going to collapse. And so coming out of this, you know, Hitler had Ludendorff with him. So that might have caused some people to kind of suspend their complete dismissal. But a lot of this was also about uh, I think political theater and you'd had leading up to this and still did afterward, maybe less afterward for a while, um, you know, active street fighting between communists and SA in the Nazi party and, and others. And so having sort of a mass march on state government in Munich and which had been the site of one of those Soviets in 1919, and then saying first Munich, then we turn toward Berlin. I mean, it fell apart immediately. I think they thought, and in particular Hitler thought maybe, that the military would support the Nazis in their putsch. They didn't. And, and so that was part of the issue. So Hitler was pretty quickly caught. He was brought to trial, um, but he came in front of a very sympathetic judge. And so for, the, you know, the crime of trying to overthrow the Weimar Republic, he got the low, low price of five years in prison and only served 11 months. The Nazis were made illegal as an organization. And this is another time period where 
you know, kind of thinking in terms of phases. I, it's sort of how I like to frame it when I'm teaching the subject is that the Nazi party, even though it had party in the name, I wouldn't argue was really about electoral politics. It wasn't thinking that way. That wasn't the approach. It was much more trying to model Mussolini and the March on Rome. So you've got that. Um, after the Beer Hall Putsch and after the Nazis were made legal again in 1928 is when there's this focus on, okay, a March on Rome isn't gonna work for us. Obviously this didn't work. We need to destroy the Weimar Republic using its own mechanisms of electoral democracy. And they were open about that. I mean, Mein Kampf was written while Hitler was in prison, came out, was published in 1924. It was pretty clear what the general plan was, but the Nazis were made illegal for four years. They came back and they were allowed to participate in elections starting in 1928. Mm. So, but as we know, they went underground and as secret organizations. Of and course. of course, they kept going. Yes, definitely. And the other thing that I would argue that you see is they were active in terms, almost in like chapters in different states. And so the party overall was one structure, but you also had, you know, the Bavarian party, you had the Schleswig party, you have the party in different cities with leaders that were kind of homegrown there and starting to espouse some of these ideas. And they were really important in spreading Nazi influence, even when the Nazis themselves were underground. And it was sort of latching on to all of those revenge politics, maybe, re all of those issues that went all the way back to the war was over and we didn't like how it ended. We didn't like the approach that, you know, Germans could be dictated to through the Treaty of Versailles and tell us what we can do and how we can run our country and how big our army can be and all of these things, what we can manufacture and what we can't. Um, it, it's, a, it's an interesting story. And I think trying to get out what people thought, again, comes to what their propensity toward, you know, extreme politics might be, what they thought of Hitler before, if they even knew of him, and, and what their main concerns were. You know, if you have people who are looking for stability, they're not going to necessarily be looking at the Nazis in 1923. They might be after 1929, when the Nazis are promising stability, but not right away. They were kind of being viewed as part of the problem by a lot of people. And for the people who were all about being part of the problem, that would then attract more people who were willing to kind of push the envelope and to be more extreme. Or that they could be viewed as, and this is part of the other issue, right? Part of the other reason I think that the Nazis were effective in many ways in bringing down the Weimar Republic is that they had help. They were helped by institutional parties. They were helped by industrialists like Alfred Hugenberg, who had access to communication and owned a lot of newspapers and the film industry, the film house that made a lot of films for export, that the Nazis were viewed as a convenient tool, but that they were not controllable the way that people thought they would be. And I would, I think I'm wrong, but I was in 1928 election, they get 11 people inside the government, the Weimar right. Republic. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm right on the year here, but what is the, what is the Nazis influence inside the government with just 11 people? Probably not much. I mean, the thing is, so 1928 is the first year that they can be part of electoral politics. And they get approximately nationally speaking, like 2% of the vote, right? This is the 11 people. Uh, they, when you consider the fact that all of these other parties that are helping to create the Weimar government is coalition, like generally it's still 11 people. I don't wanna say that 11 people's influence would be outsized because they were valuable coalition partners, but they could be viewed that way. They're just one more person to add, right? To uh, ensure yeah. policy. I kind of always imagine that those 11 people were there kind of just involved and pressured the other politicians mm -hmm. to do what they wish. Is that correct? Or did, they, did they do this kind of thing? Did they bully and threaten the, the other politicians to do I, kind of their bidding? 
I don't think at the beginning, I think they wanted to, they wanted to be viewed as sort of a strong force and that if they wanted to, they could say align with the KPD, the Communist Party, right? In a, in a brown red alliance that was threatening to the existence of the Weimar Republic. Um, I, I, I think they would have obviously been contained 11 people's not much. And uh -huh. they probably wouldn't have even really been sought out for votes they probably wouldn't have been like, you need to do this or else, though there was obviously voter intimidation in places, but it was still pretty minuscule. But one year after that election, you have the stock market crash. And as I mentioned before, right, the Reichsmark was based on the US dollar. So when the stock market crashes in the United States in October of 1929, it kind of aligned again in another perfect storm of awfulness. Stresemann, that sort of figure of stability, dies of a heart attack about a week and a half before the stock market crashes at the end of October. So you have this sort of main pillar who had kind of been a stabilizing force, gone. You have the stock market crash and any loans or anything like that that the US had for German companies or even the government itself uh, started to be called in as that catastrophe widened. I mean, this was a global issue. There were a lot of countries that were impacted by the stock market crash. And we, with all of this, you can kind of see why people started voting for analysis in 32 and 33 mm -hmm. as well. Right, well, and, and so you have, you know, 2% of the vote in 28, that jumps to 17% mm -hmm. of the vote in 30. So 1930, about 17% of the vote. Um, in 1932, Hitler runs for president. He doesn't get president, but chancellor the Nazis, had correct. Yeah, well, he becomes chancellor later, um, partially because the Nazis get 37% of the vote nationwide. And only in one state did the Nazis ever get over 50% of the vote. And that was Schleswig-Holstein because there was sort of this approach to, you know, blood and soil. Walter DeRay, who was all about this blood and soil and going back to pastoral Germany, but also an economic powerhouse that's industrial, but you know, getting back to the real Germans, the real people. And of course, by implication, this means there are people who are not mostly Jews, but also others like Roma and, and other people who may not have Germany's best interests at heart, the internationalists, right? This, this sort of view. And so, after that, the Nazis become the biggest party in the Reichstag. Part, and, and you actually see a lot of gains for the KPD as well. So it's not just the Nazis. But well, they eventually the get like 600 people inside the, the, the right. Republic. Right. So what happens is, you know, the, the tradition, well, tradition, but the procedure had really been that the chancellor gets appointed by the president, who was Hindenburg. And by this point, Hindenburg was in poor health. He's, you know, a war hero, but he's old and in poor health. And did he support the Nazis or was he kind of iffy about them? He, he was iffy, but he also, I don't think, truly thought they would be as big a threat as they were. And this was other people too. Other conservatives felt the same way. Franz von Papen, who basically mm -hmm. helped broker the agreement with Hindenburg to appoint him. I actually, actually want to ask you about this because I was going to, uh, don't mean it to ask who, who was Papen and what, what was his role in the state in Hitler as chancellor because he is quite essential to the story. He is. So he is a politician who was in charge. Well, he was, he had been chancellor previously and he was a well-known politician. And of course, now <laughs> my, my memory is escaping me. I'm pretty sure he was the center party, but of course now I don't remember. I think he was more of a monarchist than anything. My, my dissertation advisor it's is cringing see if I can find right it, now. Yeah. yeah, my dissertation advisor is cringing right now going, oh, Erica, you need to remember the party. Um, but he you know, had basically greased the reels and said, if you make me, co-chancellor or vice chancellor, you know, we can contain the force that are the Nazis and we need them for our coalition anyway. We can have a much more yeah. right-leaning, right-wing, but right-leaning government as opposed to sharing with say the SPD. And, you know, most of the time the chancellor came from the largest party in the Reichstag. And so this was, 
this was common practice. It would have kind of stood out in some ways if Hitler had not been appointed chancellor, though in all honesty, nobody was really excited to put this guy in the chancellor's seat. Um, and so Poppin, von Poppin's uh, you know, argument in his backroom deal that I'm gonna be right there, what can he really do? Mm. Uh, so if I remember, I'm reading, I didn't know what to refer to John Tolles, but which I'm mm-hmm. currently reading. And uh, it wasn't the, the plan to make him kind of the Hitler, kind of the puppet, to control him if they right. if he got the power. Right. And, and that this was essentially a power sharing agreement and that, you know, the Nazis would get so many people on, essentially on the, the, what it would amount to ministries, right? Almost like the cabinet. Um, and, and then the other parties would get more. And the goal was really to contain them and to use them uh, to control them. And that just wasn't the case. It just by, by the way, I found out what party it is, center party, yeah. That's what I thought. But now yeah. I, was, I was second guessing myself yeah. because it's been a while since I focused on party politics. And so, yeah, yeah so... Von Papen, you know, he later was actually tried at uh, Nuremberg as an enabler to bring, you know, the, hit, the the Nazis into power, and he was found not guilty. He was he was not given jail time uh, because he wasn't viewed as being part of the Nazi regime at all. But was um, he but, pro them, or was he the kind of like hoping that he, as I mentioned before, using Hitler as a puppet to get control? The Frankly, I just, I, I just think he did not appreciate the danger and he did not take some of what the Nazis and Hitler in particular, but other Nazis too. This wasn't just the Hitler show, right? There were plenty of other Nazis like Goebbels, like Goering, um, who also, right, was a World War I ace, flying ace, war hero, veteran. Um, there were a series of other Nazis who were just as committed if not maybe a little more strategic and were about implementation of policy and getting things to happen that was that were as important as Hitler himself was. And so this was, I think, a complete misreading of exactly what was happening and being unwilling to actually believe that they would want to overthrow the democracy and establish a dictatorship, that they would want to outlaw every other party. I was going to say, we all know what happens. We do, we do. And I think it was just fundamentally the the establishment parties that helped bring Hitler in just completely did not appreciate his words for what they were and, Mm -hmm. and policies for what they were and what they were trying to do and thought, you know, this is a flash in the pan and we can harness it and sort of get our own power and then we can dispense of him when we are done. And I mean, there's a little bit of, of truth in that the elections early in 1932 had these massive wins for the Nazis in 19, uh, 37% roughly. Yeah. There were another round of elections in November where the Nazis lost a little bit of support, not very much three, four percent, but it was sort of like on its way up and then on its way down. And so in a lot of ways, this was kind of viewed, you could argue, by the Nazis as being the moment they needed to take control if they were going to, and was misread by institutional or establishment parties where they were like, oh, see, it's already waning. They're already tired of this. Nobody could really believe that this was going to happen. And you know, nobody really anticipated a Reichstag fire, maybe. I don't know. Um, there were a series you, of things. What do you believe, that it was the Nazis and not the communists to set fire to the Reichstag? Or do you think it was <sighs> I mean, one guy? I don't remember his name, but... Uh... Yeah, his name escapes me. But, I mean, the it's really convenient for a month after Hitler's appointed chancellor mm. for the Reichstag building to burn. Mm. and And so... You know, obviously, and they conveniently confessed. Well, right, and there's evidence also that the confessor, you know, might have been developmentally disabled in some way, or had been coerced. All of these things. I mean, it's 
it, it's pretty believable that the Nazis did it themselves. Uh, but then again, you know, I haven't seen archival material that says, "Dear Diary, I'm a Nazi and I burned the Reichstag." So, you know, it, it's to one be of fair, those they did document quite a lot. So, maybe, maybe right. one 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 diary has that. Well, it might be in somebody's <laughs> attic somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> um, for sure. But I mean, it's it's. I think it's entirely possible that the Nazis did it. I think it's entirely possible that uh, somebody else did it for reasons unknown. Uh, but the end result, ultimately, the meaning was that it gave the Nazis the pretext they needed to revert to rule by decree, which had happened before in other situations, in other putches, in other you know catastrophic events. And, and then they began legally essentially making it impossible to have any challengers. They just, they made other parties illegal. They arrested and, communists. They... Right. And, and enshrined it in law. They made sure to pass these through the Reichstag when the Reichstag still existed until the Reichstag decided that they could just, that it could dispense with itself. Mm -hmm. And, you know, onward we go. And, and then things evolve over time, which is why there was such this, this viewpoint and an emphasis on enshrining what the Nazis wanted to do in law, because it would be harder to undo. So. And I want to, so, and then, then of course, the Weimar Republic falls to Hitler, who became a dictator, and up mm -hmm. until 45, of course. Mm -hmm. And what do you think is the conclusion? of the Weimar Republic, in your oh, opinion. That is interesting. And you know, oh, I don't know. That's a very, very good question because I think there were there, there were a lot of different moments where the brakes could have been put on, even after the Nazis took power and disenfranchised and, and made other parties illegal. Uh, they didn't have full control right away. Even with the Enabling Act, even with all of these laws that were being put in, you know, for whatever reason, they never went after Hindenburg. Hindenburg dies in 1934, right before the Nuremberg uh, rally that year, which is the one that's been immortalized on film in Triumph of the Will. And you have then further laws later on, the 1935 Nuremberg laws that really delineated who was citizen of Germany based on racial characteristics in this way, really rendering any Jewish German stateless and others as well. And really in some ways narrowly defining by race who was German and had citizenship and who was not. And then also dictated, you know, sort of marriage and civil service and all of these other things. And so eat, like stripping away these different institutions that could have stopped or maybe not stopped, but at least been an obstacle to what the Third Reich became. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's difficult though. When did it end? That's a really interesting question. And I would say somewhere, <laughs> somewhere between 33 and 35 would be my oh. estimation. And really then in particular, 1938 with Kristallnacht and when policy really changes when you start to see- And of course you have the Knights of the Lord Knights as well. Of course in 34. So, you know, you have these different areas. I, I'm gonna be sitting with that question because I don't think it's so simple as to say when Hitler was appointed chancellor. I don't think it's so simple to say as when the Reichstag burned. Because I think there were bits of it. There were always people who were kind of convinced that this would just end and that, you know, it would revert because this can't possibly sustain itself. Um, so that's a, that's a really good question. But uh, I would say there were some parts even into the Third Reich where, and, it, and that was necessary in order for the Third Reich to operate the way it did is for people to kind of go, well, you know, life hasn't really changed all that much. So whatever. I mean, it's, it's not really my problem in a lot of ways. And you have, you know, now when people are asked to kind of account for why did you say nothing or why did you do nothing for so many people, even once the war starts, there, it, life is kind of normal. All that's different or the flags are different. 
there's swastikas everywhere and you know your your greetings change to Heil Hitler instead of something else mm. but um you know I I think for some people they just saw it as a, a not even a logical outcome but just maybe a phase of Weimar democracy mm. and I want to ask I was trying to tip ask a little bit of alternative history here as so a once in a while just for, give a little fun exercise do you think we would have if Hitler never came to power do you think we still would have had the Weimar Republic today it's just maybe under a different name or maybe not mm. at, exactly the Weimar Republic but do you think we would have had something like this today if Hitler never came to power also an interesting question and I think some of the the issue too is if not Hitler, someone else, likely. I mean, uh, one of the big things that I... Oh, I you think communism would, would have taken over if Hitler never... You know, I don't know. And, and maybe part of it is because my research has focused on per Nazi perpetrators for so long that I kind of haven't really focused on, <laughs> you know, the leaders of the KPD or the communist leaders such as they were up until 1933, not nearly as much, uh, is that I don't know that they were organized in the same way or focused on ending, I, I don't know that they were focused on ending the democracy expressly. They were, a lot of them were more focused on either trying to get you know the the workers of the world unite and the global revolution or socialism in one country like what lenin had kind of espoused they were dealing with the stalin issue and the reality of stalin in the soviet union but the other thing is is that i wonder about the weimar republic regardless not that World War II would have happened in exactly the same way, but you do have Mussolini to the South. You do have the Spanish Civil War. You do have, you know, sort of a far right in some ways leaning in France. You've got divisions and difficulties in, in other parts of Europe as well. And also too, you know, by the time you get to 1932-33, the war between Japan and China that kind of becomes the Pacific theater of World War II is already underway. You know, Japan had invaded Manchuria in, in 1931. So you already have, you know, sort of global violence happening that had an imperial element to it, that had a racial element to it. If Hitler never came to power, I don't know that he wouldn't be, or that the Nazis, not just Hitler, other Nazis as well, would not have been some sort of political influence, some sort of social influence. I mean, they built on fears and prejudices that were already there, even if they did take it a totally new and industrialized direction. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I, I don't think we would have the Weimar Republic as it was framed now in much the same way as we don't have, you know, the French Third Republic. Mm. I mean, there are five we, republics now. Right, right. Or, and let's talk about Italy and the number of governments mm. it's had. So, you know, it's it's sort of that, I don't, I don't know what it would look like. And I, and I think that's the difficult part to, to say, well, if this never happened the way that it happened, you know, what, what, who would have become a major figure on the far right? I don't, mm. I don't know. Oh, there were there were many, hmm. you know, there were many people who were in um, what now we might call a white nationalist or white supremacist space hmm. that that weren't even in Germany, but that were influencing thinkers in Germany and it's, and the whole eugenics movement in general. I think it's, I always think it's fascinating to think what could have happened this one little thing that could have changed history for forever yeah. from, 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 from what we know today. So I think it's quite right. fascinating to think what if what if this happened? What if that happened? Right, right. And you know, if not Hitler, well, who? Like mm. who of the people who I don't even I don't even know that I would say that Hitler surrounded himself with, but that surrounded Hitler because some of that was very calculated. Mm. Uh, you know, who of them would have found maybe more of an audience had they not been competing with 
whomever became this figure, right? Mm. And that they contributed to making Hitler this figure and this mm. figurehead. And, you know, some of this gets to individual motivation and like individual belief, like how much did they really believe in Hitler as a person and as a leader or how much of it was, yeah, I know how to say the right things. Mm dude's a lunatic but i know how to say the right thing yeah you know, and and that's a question that we likely will never have the answer to thank you so much for coming this has been about the rise and fall of the weimar republic before you go do you have anything you wish to promote and the social media where, where people might find you if they have any questions um sure i am i'm all over the place i'm on twitter under at history in short uh, and I can I can provide that in in like typing if you like, uh, and I also uh, teach at Worcester State University. And so if you look for for Worcester State University in Massachusetts, I'm online there, and my email is readily available. Um, I'm working on two book length manuscripts, one that will hopefully be out either at the end of this year or really, really early next year on uh, Nazi. Well, not just Nazi, but uh, German festivals and identity in, between 1920 and 1960, especially in Lubeck, but really kind of fit right into this period of time and talking a lot about what we were talking about. So um, yeah, that that's a lot of what where you can find me and what I'm doing. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Alan. This has been the World.H12. We are on YouTube, so at the World.H12, Spotify, and wherever you can find podcasts. And this and see we are thank you so much for listening and i'll see you next time